Before we get into this episode, we have a quick favor to ask you. If you love our show, please scroll down to the review section of your favorite podcast platform and leave us a five-star rating. If you have a few more seconds, please also leave us a review telling us what you like most about our show. We read every single one of these and we appreciate them so much. This will also help us grow and get into the ears of those who love true crime and food as much as you do. Thanks and enjoy the episode. You're listening to Unsavory, where true crime meets food. Hi, everyone. I'm Becca. And I'm Sarah. And you're listening to Unsavory. Today, we're covering one of the more questionable dieting methods in the history of dieting, I'd say. (laughs) But this is one method that surprisingly doesn't encourage restriction. Advocators actually promote this diet with the claim that you can eat whatever you want on it, but only because you have live worms living inside of you consuming your food for you. And we're talking about the tapeworm diet. I already feel nauseous. I don't know. Just thinking about people purposely eating a worm, I think I'm going to have nightmares tonight. Just nightmares of Heidi Klum's Halloween costume. Yes, (laughs) which was actually so good. (laughs) It was so good. It was so disturbing. (laughs) Yeah, but I don't think there's ever been a widespread fad diet as gross, as grotesque as this one. It's very much not doctor recommended and is actually illegal in some countries like the US where the FDA has banned tapeworm pills, as well as in Australia where it's illegal for the pills to be imported into the country. So this diet isn't as accessible as it once was, which I think is a really good thing. It sounds like a good thing. And I'm already learning because I didn't realize the tapeworms would come in a pill form. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yes, yes. We'll get into it. Okay, I'm ready. All right, let's do it. The information in this podcast is for entertainment and educational purposes only. If you're interested in medical nutrition therapy or personalized nutrition advice, please talk to a physician or registered dietitian in your area. If you have a history of disordered eating, be advised that nutrition details will be discussed and take the steps you need to protect your recovery journey. All the citations and relevant links for anything mentioned in this episode will be in our show notes on our website, unsavorypodcast.com. This podcast may contain coarse language, mature subject matter, and content of a violent or disturbing nature. Listener discretion is advised. This is an independently produced podcast. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can sign up as a donor through the Patreon link in our bio. If you could rate, review, follow, and share our show with your true crime and food-loving friends, that would really help us out, and we will be forever grateful. Hey, y'all, it's your girl, Kiki Palmer. I'm proud to introduce to you my new podcast. Baby, this is Kiki Palmer, exclusively on Amazon Music. I'm putting my friends, family, and some of the hottest experts in the hot seat to ask them the questions that have been burning on my mind. What would former child stars be if they weren't actors? It's only fans, only bad. I want to know, so I asked my mama about it. These are the questions that keep me up at night, and I'm letting y'all all in on it. Come kick it with me and my weekly guests as we go down the rabbit hole and dive deep into my mind together. Listen to Baby This is Kiki Palmer exclusively on Amazon Music. Shout out to my sources for today's episode, which are all listed in the show notes at unsavorypodcast.com. I use sources from the CDC and Cleveland Clinic, as well as articles by Debates et al., Mickelson and Mickelson, Kessa and Whitfield. And there were a lot of sources for this episode since it was difficult to find all of this information in one spot. And just a quick trigger warning, we will be discussing weight loss and historic weight loss methods in this episode. So if this is something that you find triggering or that doesn't fit within your recovery journey, please feel free to skip this one. Let's start with a brief rundown of what tapeworms are, because this is obviously critical to the story. So tapeworms have been around for much longer than even humans, with the first indication of their existence found in fossilized shark feces from over 259 million years ago. They're flat, parasitic worms that are very adaptable to their environment, meaning that they can infect a wide variety of different host species, but particularly meat-eating hosts like cats, dogs, humans, and some livestock. Once the worms are mature, they do need a host to survive, 
because they attach their heads to the insides of the host's intestines and feed off of the nutrients being digested by their host. This is already disgusting. Oh, I know. And it gets worse. (laughs) A well-nourished tapeworm will grow larger, keeping their elongated tape measure appearance, and they may even lay eggs. And these eggs will exit the host's body through their feces, where they will then start looking for new hosts to infect. The tapeworm's body has three different parts. The head, which attaches to you, as well as the neck and lower body. Each of these sections can produce eggs, and in some tapeworm species, the sections can break apart. These sections may end up in the host species, which is often the first sign of a tapeworm infection. So they're like these little wiggly things that show up in your poo that kind of look like white rice. Wow. Okay. So I guess we should all be taking a look just in case. If you're concerned, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) A healthy tapeworm can grow up to about 30 feet, (gasps) although recently one man had one that was almost 60 feet long. Oh my God. I know. And they can live up to 30 years. Oh my God. As long as the infection goes untreated and the tapeworm doesn't kill its host. The infection is often referred to as T. naysis, which comes from the T. genius and is the most common species of tapeworms to infect humans. Okay, wait. <laughs> 30 feet is so freaking long. Do they coil or do they kind of stretch out through the entire? intestines. I feel like at some point, if it's stretched out, you'd have some tapeworm coming out the other end. Or if it's (laughs) coiled, you'd have like some sort of bowel obstruction. No, absolutely. So one source mentioned that they do coil up like a ball, but I'm sure that they can stretch out if they need to. And as for bowel obstructions, we will get to that. Okay. Okay. I'm dying to know. So that's all info for intestinal tapeworms, but in some instances, a young tapeworm may leave the intestines and enter the bloodstream or other organs. This causes what's called an invasive larval infection, and it can be pretty serious. When the larvae are in different parts of the host body, they will cling on and basically create these cysts, so um, pockets of fluid with the tapeworm inside. (laughs) These cysts can be harmless, but they can also disrupt the functioning of organs. And if they stick to the host's brain or spinal cord, it can cause neurological issues such as seizures. Wow. This is disgusting, truly. Mm Mm-hmm. When the neurological system is involved, the infection is called neurocysticercosis. This is wild, but in some areas of the world, such as Asia, parts of Africa, and Latin America, neurocysticercosis causes up to 29% of cases of epilepsy in humans. And in some countries, this number is closer to 50%. So this makes this disease the leading cause of acquired epilepsy in these areas. Wow. Yeah, it's nuts. And not something I ever would have considered or even thought of for epilepsy. The worst thing about tapeworms is that you can have them in both your intestines as well as a cystic infection throughout your body, which is like a double whammy of bad luck. And this bad luck usually starts when someone eats undercooked meat or contaminated feces. So like manure that's been used as produce fertilizer, but that has tapeworm eggs in it. Hmm. So meat like beef and pork usually get a bad rep, but large freshwater fish like salmon can also become infected with the larva. This is why you must exercise extreme caution when eating any raw animal products. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be thinking twice about a lot of raw (laughs) animal products. But it's already (laughs) exceedingly clear that getting a tapeworm is not something, like it's something that should be avoided at all costs. It's not something that we should be intentionally seeking out for weight no. loss, there are Mm-mm. serious medical consequences in addition to just being super disgusting. Absolutely. And fun fact, well, not really a fun fact. <laughs> it's not fun, but it's interesting. It's theorized that humans actually gave tapeworms to livestock and not the other mm-hmm. way around. So about 2.6 million years ago when humans started to eat meat and bone marrow, It was not uncommon for game meat like antelope in areas like Africa to be infected with these tapeworms. So humans would then catch the infection, 
but there were no real treatment methods at this time. So they would live with it and pass it on within their community and outside of their community to other members. Then about 10,000 years ago, when humans began domesticating animals, they too caught the tapeworms. And there's no real rev- evidence of them having tapeworms before this. So we really can't blame beef and pork, only blame ourselves. Okay, so we've established that this is not something that you want. Tapeworms are harmful and potentially even life-threatening. So how and why did they make their way into diet culture? I'll tell you. As we know, female beauty standards have always been pretty extreme. Throughout history and in most areas of the world, from foot-binding practices in imperial China to bathing in arsenic for weight loss in countries like England. Popular quotes like, pain is beauty, perpetuated the painful and unrealistic expectations that women tried to achieve, and in many cases, continue to try to achieve. Mm -hmm. The tapeworm diet originated in the mid-1800s. It's kind of hard to believe, but the concept of a diet influencer already existed at this time. And the first influencer is often referred to as Lord Byron. Lord Byron was a famous poet and an avid dieter known to try new weight loss techniques, such as eating only biscuits and soda throughout the day and in wearing layers of wool to sweat off water weight. He actually launched the apple cider vinegar trend in 1820 by encouraging people to consume the vinegar in water for weight loss. That is so interesting that that apple cider vinegar trend has been around since 1820. Like 200 years later, it's still going strong. I know. Hmm. It's wild. Because of Lord Byron's celebrity status, people were fascinated by his lifestyle and diet methods. While he never directly endorsed the tapeworm diet, he can be credited with pushing the new Victorian beauty standard, tuberculosis chic. (laughs) The gaunt, weak look associated with the respiratory disease was the latest hot trend. I hate this. I know. I wish I was kidding. But women began trying to achieve this look by using makeup to look more pale with rosy cheeks and crimson red lips, as -hmm. well as by implementing weight loss methods and wearing corsets to get the quote-unquote ideal 16-inch waist that was associated with looking ill. Wow. Okay. Before the 1800s, corsets were typically made out of like different types of fabric, whalebone, wood, or metal to kind of give it that stiff look in the front, as well as laces to tie it closed. But with the invention of pliable, moldable rubber by Charles Goodyear, women realized it was much more effective in holding in excess flesh. And as a bonus, it would make you sweat in the process, leading people to believe that it was also contributing to weight loss while they wore it. However, what it actually did was create a moist environment where it would wear the skin down, causing friction wounds and making the area more susceptible to infection. The shape of the corset would also displace organs, often pushing intestines down lower, which I can only imagine did a number on digestion. Oh, for sure. That sounds so incredibly painful and uncomfortable. I can't even imagine being in a social situation and wearing one of these rubber corsets and having to like have a conversation and be pleasant. I would be so miserable. Yes. I am just so glad that I was not born in the Victorian era because it seems uncomfortable. seems like everyone was very hungry. Ugh. Mm-hmm. Sounds awful. Yeah, sounds like a nightmare. And it seemed like there was really like no limit that these fashionable Victorians would do. So, and there, like, I guess there really wasn't, which is exactly how the tapeworm diet, which as we've established is a parasitic infection, became popular. So Victorians saw people across the world withering away after contracting these worms, and they figured that they could use this to their advantage women would consume the larva, which would migrate into the woman's intestines, mature, and live there, consuming a significant portion of their caloric intake. That is just so messed up. I am a little bit curious if the tapeworm dieters feel full or not, because if they're eating whatever they want, but they're not getting any of the nutrition, then their body would be like asking for it. It would be like, It's essentially starving, even Mm -hmm. though you're eating. And 
there's the additional element of this large foreign tapeworm in your stomach that's taking up space and probably making them feel definitely bloated and maybe full. Yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious for what the user experience was like. Yeah, no, the two of the side effects are hunger Mm. or loss of appetite. So I think that it can be both, honestly. Like you might be hungry initially when the tapeworm is small and maybe it's not taking up that much space in your colon or stomach or what have you. But then maybe as it's getting bigger and it's pushing on your other organs, kind of like carrying a child. True. (laughs) I've heard like the... (laughs) Well, I've heard that the third trimester of pregnancy, sometimes women don't feel hungry, but then they also feel hungry because they have like a child pushing on all of their organs. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. (laughs) So think of your tapeworm as a child, everyone. In 1912, reports of the diet being adopted in the U.S. began popping up. And this is where tapeworm pills apparently came into the picture. You might remember that I mentioned that tapeworms need a host to survive. So it was almost impossible to transfer a live worm into a new host. This meant that people would need to consume infected food products in order to get the benefits they were after. And I say benefits, that's in quotations. (laughs) And this is a very tricky practice, especially since tapeworm infection wasn't as common in North America as it was in other areas of the world. But you might also remember that while tapeworms need a host to survive, the eggs and larvae do not. Mm, Ew. I see where this is going. But I'm kind of (laughs) curious if, you know how people travel to other countries to get like surgeries that aren't readily available here or have like long wait lists or high price tags like gastric bypass surgery or plastic surgeries, they'll go to another country where it's sometimes less safe, not always. Mm -hmm. I wonder if people would do that with tapeworms. Go places where they're more readily available. I'll bet they would. One thing that I I didn't actually include in this is that there are some areas, I know like Mexico that has these worm clinics still to this day where you'll pay over $1,000 for like (gasps) one organism, aka worm. A tapeworm. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know the legitimacy of these clinics or anything like that, but they apparently do exist in some areas of the world still. Oh my goodness. Okay. Wow. (laughs) It's a market for everything. There truly is. Okay. So an unknown genius had this idea of freeze drying beef tapeworm cysts with the tapeworm (laughs) larva inside to create a pill for easier transport and a better shelf life. The idea was that the dried larva would be consumed and tapeworms would then mature in the intestines, absorb the food nutrients, and result in the desired weight loss. So basically the same concept as sea monkeys. Except you don't actually get to keep it as a pet, or you kind of do get to keep it as a pet. It just lives inside your stomach for up to 30 years. Yes. After, after like looking this up, though, I did go on a little hunt for sea monkeys on Amazon, and they are still available if anyone wants them. Oh, nice. (laughs) Yeah, they're so cool. They are really cool. I never had any, Mm -hmm. though. You didn't? I didn't. I was deprived. I feel like I went through so many batches of sea monkeys. (laughs) It's so cool. So they come in like, I mean, you might know this, but they come in like a little pouch. Yeah. And they're like like dry. Like fish food almost. And then you put them in water and then they come to life. But I guess they don't live for 30 years like a good old tapeworm, hey? I never had mine for 30 years. Okay. We should try. (laughs) I don't actually want to try, but just theoretically, I bet we could order tapeworm pills on the black market, Mm. and hatch them outside of a human body, like in a tank, in a thing of water, whatever their optimal environment is, and then you have a pet, a long-lasting pet. Not it. Yeah, I'm not doing it. I don't want to be a part of this. (laughs) (laughs) But if anyone wants to do it on our, (laughs) and just let us know how it goes, I'd be curious. It would be a very cool experiment. Okay, so there was such little regulation around diet pills at this time that companies could almost promote or say anything to sell the tapeworm diet pills. One such promotion claimed tapeworm has been a natural part of human intestinal flora for millions of years, protecting from obesity and stimulating immunity, which is just such BS. And Mm -hmm. this is also the perfect example of why we should not trust the all natural claim because 
technically it is true. But the reason that they were a part of human intestinal flora was because people were contracting and dying from this infection before there was a way to get rid of them. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, natural definitely doesn't always mean better. Mm -mm. It's the classic appeal to nature fallacy, which honestly I think is the sneakiest one of all. Yes, so sneaky. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like it actually works really well. I completely agree. And I don't, I never really like hate on brands that use the term natural. No. Maybe I should. (laughs) I don't, because it's not necessarily a bad product because it's natural either. Mm -mm. It just kind of, it just needs more critical thinking. It just means nothing. It's a term that means literally nothing. Yeah. Arsenic is natural. Mm -hmm. Arsenic is natural. So is urine. Tapeworms. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So these miracle diet pills were so sought after during this time that even in the book Seabiscuit, author Laura Hillenbrand mentions that many horse jockeys would try to get their hands on the diet pills to lose and maintain weight for racing, which I thought was so interesting. That is so interesting. There was a use outside of diet culture too. Yeah. But like, I guess jockeys, they try to stay like fairly petite for racing, right? So yeah, it's outside better of for the horse. dieting, kind of. But jockeys are probably just dieting if they don't have the pills anyways. Yeah, for sure. It's just very interesting. Okay, so in many cases, this is interesting, weight won't actually be lost until the worm is removed. Unless you are also experiencing diarrhea and vomiting, the worm grows larger but remains inside the host. So the mass or the weight of the worm weighs down on the digestive tract and isn't removed until the worm itself is also removed. This is, that is revolting. I know you can't see me and no one can see me, but my hands are like covering my eyes. This is so (laughs) gross. So basically like weight wouldn't actually be lost, but your body composition would probably be changing because you're mal, like making yourself malnourished essentially. Mm-hmm. But you've you're you're the number on the scale is staying the same because you've got a giant parasite growing in your GI tract. Yep. Cool. <laughs> cool, cool. I just, um, <laughs> and some other side effects and complications of an intestinal tapeworm include things like, like I said, persistent hunger or loss of appetite, hmm. nausea, fatigue, stomach cramps, or even allergic reactions to the larva. Ooh. And with even more serious issues occurring over time, like nutrient deficiencies such as anemia, obstructions in the intestines, like you mentioned, appendix mm-hmm. and bile duct obstructions. Or if the infection leaves the digestive system, you can get cysts in the lungs, liver, heart, eyes, or brain, leading to possible seizures, meningitis, brain swelling, and dementia. None of this is good. None of this is good. Please. Nobody try this, ever. Mm -mm. Ever, ever, ever. And if you do have a tapeworm, please go seek help. Yeah, please seek help. (laughs) They are still fairly common in a lot of parts of the world. I wonder how quickly you'd notice if you had one. Because you wouldn't know, right? You would eat something and then you'd probably start feeling like, oh, extremely hungry and not able to satisfy it. Or Mm -hmm. noticing weight loss without trying, unintentional weight loss, something like that. Yeah. And uh, like up until the point where you start seeing things in your your poo. Oh yeah. You probably don't think you have a tapeworm. You might think I have the flu or something along those lines, but mm-hmm. you might not necessarily go straight to a worm. Yeah, that would be the last thing I would go to. <laughs> Same. Hopefully we never get tapeworms. Mm-hmm. Okay, so eventually antiparasitic medication became available on the market to kill off these tapeworms. But of course these meds were created more so for those who contracted tapeworms from infected food stuff and not for people willingly ingesting them. The most important thing in treatment is that you must dislodge the tapeworm head from the wall of the intestines because its body can regenerate. So creepy. <laughs> it is so creepy. I'm just, to make this easier for myself, I'm just picturing Heidi Klum as the tapeworm. Yes. <laughs> her just <laughs> wiggling around in her yeah. costume. <laughs> yes. It's helping. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) 
So before medication was available, there were two more popular methods of removing tapeworms from the colon, neither of which sound very pleasant. So for both of these methods, once a person reached their desired weight, they would starve themselves for a few days so that the worm was hungry. The first treatment method created by a Dr. Myers involved placing a cylinder stuffed with food on a string and lowering it down into the host's throat. This would entice the worm who was hungry to follow the food in the cylinder as it made its way back out of the host's mouth. But one ginormous issue with this method was that many people would choke on the cylinder and die. Oh my, okay. That can't have actually worked. Also, they would choke on the tapeworm if it was big mm-hmm. enough. Mm-hmm. Ew. This feels made. Yeah. This feels like this feels like a urban legend. So there are some not real images, but like drawings and stuff of these practices oh, kind of taking place. I'll add them in the the Instagram post. But yeah. it's all like pretty questionable. Like these things are written up in many sources. Mm -hmm. But the legitimacy of a lot of this is kind of iffy. Okay. And also, like, our stomach is filled with acid. Are tapeworms just indestructible? I don't know. That's a question for the tapeworms. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That was hilarious. Okay, so the second method, and my personal favorite, (laughs) involves starving the worm, then placing glasses of milk at basically both of the orifices, so the mouth (laughs) and the anus. No. And then to wait... (laughs) For the worm to wiggle its way out. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> this can't be. <laughs> this is. No, oh I know. Oh, my God. It's so weird. And I, as I said, I, I'm not sure how effective these methods were or if they were actually used that much. But thank goodness for medication. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. These are actual methods that used to be used before there was a medication to get rid of tapeworms. These were methods that were in multiple sources. Multiple sources. So tapeworms love milk. I wonder if they tried, I wonder if there was like a nice um, randomized control study done on the types of foods that tapeworms (laughs) preferred when you're trying to get it to wiggle out your (laughs) anus. Likely not, but they they do like host themselves or like find hosts in cattle too, right? Yeah, I so guess. maybe they I mean, like cow's milk. I know. And for a second, I was forgetting that this is a real huge problem worldwide, not just for the diet mm-hmm. or the theoretical diet. Like, mm-hmm. of course, they would have to be creative with trying to get rid of these because it could really ruin someone's life. Yeah, for sure. But I almost feel like a better method would be to, like, put somebody else's mouth, somebody who had just eaten a lot of food's mouth near the person who has a tapeworms or other orifice to try to get the thing in the other host. Into another host. But you, even at the start, you were like, it's hard. Oh, what did you say? Something like it's really difficult to get a full tapeworm to leave its host. So mm-hmm. you have to have like the eggs. Mm-hmm. Am I making that up? No, no, you didn't. It's true. You can't. It's hard to transfer a tapeworm from host to host. Right. It's more likely that the eggs or the larva will be transferred. Gotcha. So the idea is that the person makes themselves very, very hungry. They don't give the tapeworm any other food to keep eating. And then Mm -hmm. it has to seek another host. Exactly. Well, they could just put like a steak. I feel like a steak or like a piece of pork would be better than a glass of milk. So there was one instance where it literally did say steak, but I only saw that once. So I included the the milk milk. example instead of the steak one. But apparently steak was used too. Okay. Okay, so with the severe consequences and pretty morbid treatment methods, it's shocking that anyone would want to try this diet. And to this day, it continues to be brought up as a quick fix for weight loss, while the legitimacy of these claims still remains a bit questionable. One thing that pushed the narrative a lot was celebrity endorsements, or at least perceived celebrity endorsements. Women like Claudia Schiffer and Maria Callas, a famous opera singer, were rumored to have tried the diet. However, with Maria Callas, it was later found through her biography and personal communications that she had had a love for steak tartare and had actually contracted the infection by eating raw beef, so not diet pills. 
Okay. But headlines would make an attempt to glamorize the diet, make it seem purposeful and effective. Even the Kardashians have actually mentioned wanting to try it on their Keeping Up with the Kardashians show. Hmm. In 2013, a woman in Iowa purchased and consumed tapeworms, forcing the state's Department of Public Health to issue an official warning of its dangers. Wow. As I mentioned earlier, many countries have now banned the distribution of these pills. But historians disagree on whether true tapeworm pills were actually ever distributed at all, or if there was a placebo effect on those desperate enough to try to consume them. So we have access to like vintage ads promoting them to prove their presence in the market, but with no proof that the products actually produce the effects that they promised. Interesting. There is the question of whether this diet in pill form was actually a fad beyond the Victorian era or if it's complete fiction. Huh. But it is confirmed that they did it in the Victorian era. Yes. And in the Victorian era, I do think that they were eating infected food or the eggs or larvae rather than pills. But perhaps the scariest thing about this diet is that it just refuses to die. It continues to linger in pop culture, enforcing the idea that female bodies are subject to trends. Yeah. And it's also like, it's so sensational. It's so gross and it's so outrageous. I think that's why it refuses to die. Mm -hmm. in part. And I also think that something that's so insane about this diet is that it's making you sick and it's making you malnourished. And I bet if someone was actually trying it, it's not like they would look their healthiest and glowing and full of energy and like they were making positive lifestyle changes. They would probably look really depleted and tired and ill because they actually are. They have a parasite. Yeah. And this kind of all reminds me of that New York Post headline that's been going around on social media and like yeah. in the media in general that says heroin chic is back. Have you seen that? Yeah, it fills me with rage. It yeah, fills it's me so with twisted. Utter rage. It's so twisted if and it's the same as tuberculosis chic that you said at the start. Like society mm -hmm. is really really twisted if people want to look like they have an opioid use disorder or tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Those are two yeah. very unhealthy conditions. It's so f***ed up and it's so intense. And mm -hmm. women's bodies, females' bodies are not up for discussion in terms of trends. Like, for sure. It's ridiculous not how trends. Like, every few years, we're not trends. How every few years there's like a new body type that women are supposed to strive for. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Back to the story. The good news for us who never want to try this diet, mm -hmm. the tapeworm diet, cooking food to its proper internal temperature does kill off live tapeworms. So if anything, let this be your sign to get a meat thermometer. I will be getting one immediately and I will never <laughs> eat tartar again. Never, ever, ever. Mm -mm. Actually, I don't know. I mean, I mean, maybe if I'm at a nice restaurant, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> never say never. Yeah. <laughs> but I really hope that nobody listening ever, ever, ever tries this diet. I know. I just, I hope this is just a PSA, if anything. Mm -hmm. Anyways, that's it. The end. That was awesome. That was awesome and revolting. I really liked that episode, though. And um, it was a wonderful story. You told it very, very well. Thank you. And yeah, I almost like wish I could erase the tapeworm diet from my mind, though. But like, aren't you kind of happy that you know? Am I? All about it. I'm just going to be picturing milk at the two <laughs> entry points, entry and exit points, and a taper. Like, I'm going, I am immediately going to Google those images as soon as I... I was going to say, you don't have to picture it. I will send you a photo. <laughs> please, please, <laughs> please do. Uh, good job, Becca. <laughs> oh, thank you. And thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Unsavory. You can find all of the references and materials used to put this episode together in our show notes at unsavorypodcast.com. This is an independently produced podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would rate, review, follow, and share our show with your true crime and food-loving friends. 
this is the best way that you can support us for free. If you'd like to donate to our podcast, you can sign up as a donor through our Patreon link in our bio. For more information, follow us on Instagram at Unsavory Podcast. If you have an idea for an episode or segment, email us at unsavorypod at gmail.com. This podcast was recorded and edited by Jeff Devine. Learn more at Jeff Devine Sound on Instagram. Instagram.